Hey guys, this will be video 16 for the uh, Les Paul restoration. I'm going to dive right in. I got cut off in the last video at when I was discussing the various bits that I used to create the uh, truss rod channel. So I'm just going to pick right, right up, right back where I, I got cut off. Uh, what I was talking about when I made seven or eight passes in order to uh, create the truss rod channel, imagine this is on the table. Make sure I'm in the camera. I'm sorry, I may be a little bit high. Imagine this is the table and the bit is sticking up and it's only protruding out of the table, maybe a uh, maybe an eighth of an inch. It doesn't even have to be that high. All you're doing right now is just kind of verifying that you didn't make some sort of mistake setting up your router table and determining the true center of the neck. I'm, I'm not going to start talking about that because if you don't understand that, you need to research how to use a router table and a fence and the fence doesn't even have to be anything incredible it just needs to be some sort of straight edge clamped to the table all you're doing is controlling either you're either moving the tool when you are working with something a workpiece or the tool is fixed and you're moving the workpiece so i would if this is the table i would start out and I would route up to, obviously you go in and kind of kiss it and just pull it up and look at it and verify you're, you're directly in, in the center. And then you would push down uh, to a point that you've uh, predetermined where is your stopping point. There's no sense in routing all the way through. Just route up to the point where you know your truss rod uh, is going to uh, stop and go with the shortest truss rod possible but make sure that the truss rod at a minimum goes up into the heel area because the heel area and the and the overhang area back here it's fixed it's not going to move so there's no sense in having a truss rod that goes all the way out to the end of the neck so you would make that first pass up to and I've got little dash lines right here and then I stop and if I'm happy with that then I, I raise the bit up out of the table a little bit up to the point where I hit about a quarter of an inch because my truss rod is three eighths of an inch deep. And why do I use that for the first cut? Because these are very aggressive and very sharp and also they're very affordable. I don't have a problem burning up a bit like this, but if, I, if I've got a Freud or a really expensive bit, I don't want to use it to do all this uh, mass rough out. So I'll make my last pass, I'll set that to about 3 8 of an inch deep or whatever the truss rod requires. Then I'll make that pass up to that same point. And then um, I know now I've got a round to bottom. Because if you just ran this through the table saw, what's going to happen, you're going to have a square channel bottom and you're going to have a truss rod that is round. And what's that? you got a lot of wasted you got you got a lot of material that you took out that didn't require to be taken out and if your truss rod was small there's a risk that it could bow over to one side or bury up into one of the corners and it's not as effective so and then the last pass which is where I got cut off is the 3 8 that's where you're doing step I'm sorry that's and I'm so sorry I may not even be in the camera let's see how high can I hold this and still be in the camera yeah I need to stay about right here so your last pass, you're only, this is on the table, you put this down, you know, on the fence, and then you start pushing up into it, and you're just kissing it, because you want to really, truly verify, is that perfectly centered? If it's not, it's not the end of the world. It, it's, you, you know, move over to the left or move over to the right, even if your truss rod channel you started doing all this routing and you realize, oh man, I'm like a half a millimeter off center. That's not the end of the world. It's not our target. We want dead pure center, but it's not the end of the world if your truss rod is off just ever, ever so slightly. I'm not talking a sixteenth or an eighth. That's a mistake. But anyway, then you're gonna you're gonna come in, and this depth is probably gonna hit about right here. And what I failed to mention when I was talking about this whole quarter inch wood still remaining, by the time these bits come out into this area, it starts exponentially getting thicker. So 
that's why even if you start stepping the bit down to accommodate the truss rod, even if I come out 7 16 7, if I go roughly a half inch deep out here, but I'm bringing that bit only up to about that point right there, I've still got 3 8 of an inch material, if not more. So I think that's pretty self-explanatory, but it's pretty important because if, you, if you've never built a neck, I can't even begin to explain to you how many hours that I've spent really trying to improve on the whole truss rod channel exit out of the neck. And I haven't seen anybody do that, and, I, and especially with the little fillet glued in after the fact. So I just think it's a very nice, uh, nice uh, treatment. Also, another thing, when you've got a little piece like this, put some green tape on it. Because when you're up here on a desk and you pull the vacuum out and you start cleaning up, you can't identify that between a scrap piece of trash. But if you've got a little tape on it, now you got it identified. All right, uh, very quickly, let's see where we are time-wise. Six minutes, 12 seconds, not too bad. Uh, I'm going to do some quick demo on how I would glue up a neck. And even... I'm even going to show you how I do a little, uh, uh, like a, a reveal. Let me just do it, do it dry first. So you can't really, you can't probably can't see it because this is poplar. That's maple and that's poplar. But very quickly, let me try to run through this. What 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 I've got there in my hand is kind of like a very small sample of this area of the neck. Well, actually, the the whole heel. So what I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm not going to try to glue all of these three pieces up at once. Uh, what I'm going to do, first off, what I'm going to do, seriously do, I'm going to engineer the wood. I'm going to look at the grain of these two sticks and I'm going to ask myself, where, where do I want them in relation to each other? Do I want them like this? Or, and this, is, this starts when you're roughing out an actual board. A one inch by three or four by 30, 32, 36. You need to study that board and you need to look at those annular rings and ask yourself, when I cut this up into two or three pieces, where do I, how do I want this to come together? And I can't even go into that. If you don't understand that, it's not the end of the world. Just grab a board and start looking at it and just start thinking about it. Well, I want these to mirror one another. I want it to kind of look like a book match and just, you'd be surprised the board will tell you how best to use it just by analyzing the grain. Okay, so, and I didn't assess this, it doesn't matter, but what I did do is make a, uh, make a, like a, let me see if this is in the camera. Can you see that little pencil mark? See how that's like the neck coming down that goes into the heel and it turns down? Well, then I've got it drawn on the other side as well. Because when you're sitting here getting ready to glue up a neck, the last thing you want to do is have these two boards laying up on the table and then you put the glue on the wrong side and they were supposed to glue together like this and you ended up gluing them like that and you didn't find out till it's dry, it's too late. You know, you don't want to start cutting it apart. So my identifiers would be something like this right here. Let me see if this will show up on the camera. Yeah. Okay, if those, those are the two pieces, I make an X and then I circle it. Anytime I have an X in a circle, I know that I want those two parts to glue together. And that would be all you really need to really make sure you stay on point. But then also, I want to I wanna work from a very concrete point. I want to go ahead and cut my length off to a certain dimension. Because when you're sitting here because we're working with tight bond now. When you're sitting here working with, with a five minute tack window, you better know what you're doing and you better have all your clamps, everything lined up so that when you join these, you're not sitting here trying to find, you know, a, a, a pencil. Um, so what I do, I go ahead and from that finished point, I go ahead and make a, a straight line across here. I'll go ahead and put a T for treble, B for base, because when I flip that neck over, that's the base side, that's the treble side. Uh, up here along the, along the middle of the neck, I do another straight line, because when I'm gluing these, if I look down 
and the, and it slipped a little bit and it's off a sixteenth of an inch, I lost my whole neck because I do something most people don't do. I I engine I I rough them out incredibly close to a finished state. I rough them out where the the fretboard surface is pretty much finished. It's it's within just a micro, just a, a couple of thousand maximum. And then even my, my uh, neck headstock angle, this one's 17 degrees, which is pretty cool. Typically they're, they're less than that on the near less pulse, but this is like a vintage uh, setup. So I go ahead and I have that pre-machined to a real precise finished state. But that forces me to work within very, very precise parameters. I can't risk being off of just the slightest because it'll com I'll completely lose the whole headstock. I'll lose the whole neck. So anyway, very quickly, I'm gonna stop talking. Show you how I do this. Uh, most guys will do this. Take a wire brush, rough up that surface a little bit. They'll wet it. Not not wet, just you know, kind of moisten it and then you let it air dry and eh, five ten minutes we're going to speed up the process so if that's in the uh, I don't know, is that in the camera yeah that's in the camera that opens up the grains and it gives you an absolutely Unbelievable glue line. Uh, the glue line is just, it pretty much becomes uh, near transparent. It, it's just amazing. Okay. I'm just going to do this and maybe make a statement or two as I'm doing it. Turn the camera. Yeah. Robert Benedetto, coolest trick I ever learned. His dad taught him, use your pinky. Because even if you're sitting here and you start working, you, you can let your pinky run wild and you can start working. So, I would be extremely honored if Robert Benedetto actually tripped up on one of my videos and saw that. So, if you do, Robert, that's for your dad. Alright, now what do we do here? If this is a, a large piece of that, you know, I mentioned don't glue everything up all at once. And I do not put glue on the veneers because if you put glue on them, they'll go exactly where they always wanted to go when they were in the wild. They will go crazy. They will warp, twist, um, you name it. So what I would recommend, and don't do any sliding on this. On the camera? Yeah. This is a pretty small piece. What I'm going to do here, um, and typically my veneers, I let them run a little bit wild. Notice how my the piece on the right does not have glue. So guess what I'm guess, guess how I'm, first off, don't start grabbing for clamps. Just be patient, be cool. Check your check your end. Look down at your pencil line. You start putting clamps on this too soon. Uh, it'll start slipping around on you. Give it just a minute or two. Where's the camera? What time are we? Wow, it's already up to 14 seconds. That's amazing. I mean, 14 minutes. All right, so that should be enough for general tack. I'm just going to use these little micro clamps just for. Just because this is not all that important anyway. This I'm going to end up turning this into like a little uh, sanding stick. So see how you're using the, in this neck, it would be the base. Am I on the camera? Yeah, it would be the base uh, leaf acting as a call, gluing the center line to the treble. And the center line piece, well, who says it has to be one piece of veneer at a time? 
you know, maybe you've already, I mean, it's, it's cool. I've still got the glue on my pinky and I haven't touched anything. So, <laughs> so Robert Benedetto's dive is right. All right, so who says you have to do one piece of veneer at a time? You don't. You could glue up your center. Let me just get behind the camera. Pull it in as close as I can. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong side. I was looking, I was showing you the rough side. I actually cleaned this up. See there, it's Coca Bola, quarter inch in the middle. It's a piece of maple veneer. And then I have a piece of mahogany. That would, guys would call that a seven piece neck, which is absurd. It's not a seven piece, it's a three piece neck. Your center line is, is a laminate single board. And you've built this such that it's, uh, you can't, you cannot risk trying to, to build something beautiful if you don't know how to do this. You will for certain end up with a beautiful, beautiful disaster with zero tonal qualities at all. You got to know how to glue these up and they are under an extreme amount of compression. That's what I'm talking about. The center becomes a, a single piece of, of wood and it, and it typically should be no more than three pieces glued together like one center a veneer on either side with opposing colors according to what you're working with on your outside pieces maple or dark wood like a rosewood you just have opposing colors because the whole idea is to create the beautiful uh, piercing pinnacle lines um, word of caution don't ever let your center if you're doing a visual neck, a stain gray, you know, like a clear finish neck, don't ever let your center line go over 5 sixteenths of an inch width. 3 eighths inch max, only if you're building a really wide neck, like a classical, like a two inch wide nut. They start looking ridiculously out of scale if the center, uh, if the center leaf ends up being over 5 sixteenths of an inch thick. I won't go into detail there. I just I built the neck once. It's just going to be stunningly beautiful. And after I built it, it was like, oh man, it looked like a furniture leg. It was just not that I'm not against furniture. I love furniture and furniture building, but but it just it did not fit the guitar. Okay, enough talking about that. All right, that's uh, and another thing I didn't really mention is uh, you would you would come in here. Well, I'll, actually, I'm, I'm jumping the gun. Oh, this is what I need to mention. Let me make sure I'm in the camera. And this little tool is just a little straight edge. You can come in here and cut across that and get your glue off. If you can get to it, then all the better because you want to get the glue off. You don't want uh, glue on there, but not at the expense of screwing up your glue up. If it's going to mess up your glue up, leave it alone. And another reason why I'm letting that run high is because later on, uh, after the neck is built up, and one of the reasons why I didn't want to show the neck in its rough state, um, they look like hell. I mean, they literally look look like something you'd, you'd use to... Okay, and I did the treble side, so that had a little bit of... See how it let, let loose? Just within a fault, just a few seconds of time. Now, I wouldn't recommend putting the glue on that piece, which I almost made the mistake and did. I'm looking for my X, making sure I don't do anything stupid, and you know, or if I had a three piece, have an A, B, C, so that I truly know which one's the center that I don't pick up the, the, the base side and put it in the middle. Okay, so what I would do here, put the glue, make sure I'm in the camera. Just a little bit, didn't take much. And this is completely different. I, I typically would use uh, probably a little bit more glue than that because that centerpiece is pretty darn porous. And, and what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna show you how to do a little bit of sliding. And now, see how I've, I've got too much glue. I intentionally, I, I, I needed more, but I intentionally put too much because I want to show you how when you're really getting a look how it's trying to come apart. So you get, if that happens, don't panic, just put it back together. And I hope you can see that. See how I'm sliding? 
I'm really getting that glue out and I bring it back to my end point. I'm not worrying about anything else. I'm trying to get the ends exactly where I want them. Now, this is where it gets pretty serious and you need to, I'm gonna use this, but it's not strong enough to really, uh, I hope this is in the, I hope this is in the camera. I may be a little bit low. But for the moment, this is the most important thing is just getting this clamped up. Yeah, this, this is not strong enough for this little piece. But And then I'll, I'll flip the neck over. These would be C-clamps. And look at that. See, it just slid a little bit. Now, if it slides, get the clamps off. Get it under control. You got to get it under control. And even if you're just holding on to it. It's one thing I failed to mention once you put those two pieces together, do not take them apart because the air will hit that glue and man, it'll create a rubber gasket so fast. That's pretty close. And if you get this within like a 30 second, you're gonna level that off a little bit anyway. And at this point, uh, I'm out of the camera, but I gotta get this. Sorry about the delay, but I do wanna get this clamp. Cause, cause what I'm trying to do right now, see it's been tacking for a minute or two. See how I got the immediate squeeze out and it even slipped forward a little bit. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take it back out and I'm just gonna push it down. This is why this is what I was talking about when I was doing the top. How a lot I prefer the epoxy because I'm not freaking out about the uh, glue up time. I hope that's in the camera. Um, you can really chill out, but when you're working with a tight bond, man, you better really you better really have your stuff together. All right, let me get another little clap. And if it doesn't work, it just, if, if, if it doesn't, if it keeps slipping on me, uh, now, I didn't go ahead and do a full clamping. I just kind of, I'm just doing rip finger, finger twisting. The bottom is a little bit tight, but see, I'm ta it's tacking. That's awesome. So I know now that that neck's not going to slide around. I haven't tightened it yet. What I want to do, I want to wait. I want to wait about five minutes. And then, and then what I'm going to do is come in and torque it a little bit more. All right, let's start talking about some other stuff. I talked about wetting the surface of the wood to open the grain. I talked about uh, the precision glue lines. Uh, you don't want to sand, you do. You never want to glue freshly sanded wood. Uh, and I'm not going to start talking about aircraft frames uh, from a structural standpoint. Uh, Alright, let's talk about some other stuff. While that's drawing, I uh, talked about the 3 8 inch round nose bit, the final word. Why the round nose? Because you have the square bottom if you don't. I talked about the router table and the fence options. And then how I rough out the necks to a real precise... Uh, dimension. Another thing, I should not have mentioned anything about necks warping and, and working with a warp neck. If you, if you rough this out in a small stake and it starts curling or twisting, throw it away. Don't you dare try to start fighting something that's, especially if it has a twist. If you got a, if you got a leaf that has a twist in it and you force that together, all it's going to do, it's going to be the bad seed in the bunch and it's going to pull a good board and just in, into a distorted state and you're going to have a neck that's going to fail. So when, when I rough them out really small like this and I watch it, typically when you rough out a board that has a problem, it reveals itself immediately. I mean within five minutes that board will start going exactly where it wants to go. And if it twists, if it just bows, that's one thing. 
But if it starts cupping and twisting, throw it away. Or turn it into a sanding block. Alright, so I talked about that enough. Uh, but there isn't anything wrong with doing opposing grain. And it does add a little bit of extra strength to the neck. I'm not going to start talking about that. Most of you woodworker guys know about doing that type of stuff for like uh, furniture legs and stuff anyway. Grain traveling rings and you're laying out the rings, the bridge location in relation to the nut, speaking length. When you, I mentioned talking about, let's check the time here. Yeah, man, we're at 25 minutes. This, my phone may cut off pretty quickly. Speaking length is from the nut to the bridge, which defines the scale. If you have a 24 and 3 quarter inch scale, then you have a speaking length that is right at about 24 and 3 quarters of an inch long. The 12th fret typically hits right in the middle. It's, it's not exact, but I'm just going to say the 12th fret is in the middle. So if you've got a guitar and you want to know what the speaking length or the scale is, measure from the beginning of the fretboard or, or, the, or the strings this side of the nut and measure all the way up to the 12th fret. And if it's 12 and 3 eighths, then you've got a 24 and 3 quarter inch scale. If it's 12 and a half, then you have a 25 inch scale. If it's roughly 12 and 3 quarter, then you have a 25 and a half inch scale. Okay, so if you, that doesn't make sense, just rewind the video and it, it'll define itself. Three piece maple. Uh, and I'm going to speed up a little bit because I'm afraid the phone's going to cut off. If it does, I'll just do another video in a continuation. Uh, Three-piece maple. I just talked about the center line. I don't care if it's built up into a five-piece or three-piece or whatever the center line is. To me, that's one piece. But my target in this neck that I built here, uh, each the, the, this, the, the, the base leaf and the treble leaf, both of them were exactly one inches, one inch thick, and by the time I shaped them, leveled them, and S4S them, squared them up, they were down to 15 sixteenths. That was still an excellent neck. So once I, that, that allowed me to do a smaller, more narrow center. And, and what happens, and I'll talk about this in more detail later, when you start doing the radius neck on the, the neck, uh, the last thing you want is a three quarter inch middle three piece neck. By the time you get to the uh, first, from the nut to the third or fourth uh, uh, fret location, the, the, the wood at the base and on the treble is almost non-existent. You've routed off every bit of the wood and you've lost the structural integrity of those two boards. I don't care if it is glued up. Guess what it's glued up to? It's glued up to a board in the middle that now has a route down the middle. And like with what we saw in this other neck, it was five, it was uh, five eighths inch deep. Hell, it didn't even have a middle. There was no structural integrity of that neck. No wonder it broke. You, you probably could have, you probably fell off the couch and broke that bad. To me, that's a horrific design flaw. Uh, so I'm not going to go there anymore than what I just did. So that's why I like a, a more narrow center line. 3 8 inch max, max 5 16 I think this one's roughly right at 3 8 of an inch. But then uh, that allowed both of my leaves on the treble and the base side to be completely intact. Okay. All right, what else could I cover? I feel pretty good. I feel, let me check the phone. Yeah, we're at 28 minutes. Hopefully it'll go up to over 30, 30 minutes. Um, Three-piece maple versus five-piece only of center remains 5 sixteenths or less, 3 eighths or greater starts looking weird and out of place with the scale. Tight bond is excellent for, for gluing multi-piece pieces, but be careful saturating veneers because they'll deform, uh, especially if you have, have insufficient clamping pressure. I've already covered that. And I'm glad I was able to get this. So even if the camera cuts off, we've covered some good territory here. Um, what could I land on? Uh, I mean, what could I discuss to add to this uh, this video? I'm drawing a blank. There was something I was going to talk about about the neck. Maybe it'll come to me before it ends. But I guess the main thing is just uh, we've 
already talked about the, the truss rod enough. I probably could end the video there, or I'll just kind of start talking off the top of my head. Or maybe we can see if this, this is dry enough. And check it out. That's awesome. Once it tacked, oh, I'm so glad the camera's still running. And you actually got to see that in real time. Once it tacked, it did not... Oh, yeah, I forgot. I was going to torque it a little bit more. And let's see if we get a little bit more sque squeeze out. I hope that's in the camera. Yeah, that should be in the camera. And you, really, you want to really watch the neck. Because what we're doing here, we're really putting them together. And it's not moving. If it starts slipping on you, don't panic. That's okay. It just lets you know that you had a little bit too much glue. I'm kind of easing into it. But that little bit of pressure right there, that wrist pressure on a C-clamp, good Lord, that's probably, man, I bet that's 35 foot-pounds if not. if It's in the 30 foot-pound range. And here's what I love about the, oh, man, where's my little square tool? Oh, here it is. I'm sorry, I came off the camera there. See that glue? 31 minutes. It's about to cut off, probably. 